Welcome to the Vet Dental Show. I'm Brett Beckman. I'm a board-certified veterinary dentist, and we come to you every week on Wednesday to provide the veterinarian and the technician team some actionable things that you can use in your practice. And this episode is going to be a recorded episode that we've done in the past, not a podcast that we've recorded or not the Vet Dental Show, but actually some other information for you that we know you're going to enjoy. So sit back, enjoy, and we'll see you at the end of the podcast. Uh, Natalia asks, do we use mouth gags? You don't see any in videos. You know, that's a good question about the videos. I guess most of the time when we're doing doing the videos, we've got it in on the spot that we're actually doing the procedure. Many times I, I do use mouth gags, and the mouth gags are out of syringe barrels. So we know they're not spring-loaded, which we know can slip and cause some severe problems. They are cut in multiple lengths, and then those lengths are fitted uh, where we know we, we're starting to get resistance with the, with the patient's mouth when we open, and then we don't let, we, we never open it all the way. We just know where we're starting to get resistance, and then we open them a little further and then put the put the mouth gag in and that serves as a gag. You can do that uh, with cats with a tuberculin syringe, with a 3C syringe uh, with dogs, uh, 6CC syringe uh, with dogs. We use, um, we also use endotracheal tubes in real big dogs. So we cut the, cut like a 10 endotracheal tube or so and use that between canines. Uh, There's also some little uh, styrofoam gags that you can buy that you can use in the back uh, uh, in the premolar area that will help quite a bit as well. But yes, we do. Uh, we do use gags and only, only rare videos now that are out there now that I have are, uh, cadavers. Uh, and you can tell pretty much by the color of the, the gingiva. So most of our videos are live and we, we may or might, may not use a mouth gag in them, but I do use them, uh, quite a bit in surgery just to get better exposure. And when you think about one of the, one of the times that you want to use a mouth gag <clears throat> would be if you're working back in the caudal oral cavity trying to do a fourth upper premolar extraction, first molar extraction, because what's going to happen if you don't have that mouth open, uh, the head of the burr is going to interfere in the opposite arcade. So you're not going to be able, you have to open the mouth to get the burr in far enough uh, so that you can have good access uh, to the tooth you're working on. So that that's one uh, big instance where you would definitely want to use a mouth gag. Tips and tricks for incisor extractions. Um, not very comfortable with flat preparation and closure. Um, had two times where suture failed. In general, Michael, to answer that question, I don't recommend doing flaps in incisors unless you fracture a tooth. I recommend you do simple extraction technique and not do a flap because those flaps are very narrow based. They require quite a bit of manipulation to mobilize them, to get them to close over the um, lingual or in particular the palatal side of a, of a single extraction. So I would not recommend doing that. Now, if you have multiple extractions, like um, in a case with perio that has the marginal gingiva is really inflamed, then all that tissue is going to be fimbriated. It's not going to be tightly adhered to the bone like it is with a, say, fractured incisor that you're extracting. There's going to be less bone, so it's not going to be as hard of an extraction, but the tissue is going to be pretty nasty when you're done. So what we recommend there is just going down with a scissor and straightening both the lingual and the vestibular side or the palatal and vestibular side, and then suturing that after you've gone down in with your football burr, smooth the bone, got all the granulation tissue out, um, and just do simple interrupted closure there. So that is, that's one case where uh, we would recommend closing. The other thing I want to mention is if you are having dehiscence in that area, it probably is because the flap's too narrow and it's got too much tension. Those are two reasons why flaps don't work. The other reason is if there's no Elizabethan collar placed on the patient for two weeks to prevent self-trauma. 
So <clears throat> definitely want to do that. Definitely want to uh, make sure there's no tension on there by dissecting. If you do break one and you've got to get down in and get the root out. The other thing I'll mention along those lines, when you have a lateral incisor, that's a hard extraction. And those are, I mean, they're prone to get fractured when you have canine tooth uh, uh, fractures as well. Often that one is, is fractured too. Those are, as you know, in most cases, long, thick, and curved roots. They're in more cortical bone than the other uh, incisors, and so they're much more difficult to extract. We recommend doing most of our elevation on the mesial and palatal side on those, but both use the vet tome. Uh, the vet tome is a mechanical periotome uh, that is a flat uh, blade that moves very quickly up and down on a handpiece that is regulated by a foot pedal. <laughs> In doing so, it will go down between the bone and the tooth root and create an enlarged periodontal ligament space. And if you go to, again, go to Dr. Brett's Pets, go to the Vet Tome, uh, which is under equipment, and there's a video that shows the very first time I used that, uh, about two and a half, three years ago, where we used that on a lateral incisor in a large dog that had no perio, and we didn't even use elevators. And many times we, we, we don't need elevators. We just use that and we can go straight to the extraction forceps. And that makes many extractions, not just that tooth, but the lingual side on the mandibular canine tooth, use it on that. You don't have to take as much bone on the vestibular side when you do that in most cases. So excellent for that. We also use it if we can, uh, depending on the dog, because on, we use it on the lingual side of the mandibular first molar, if you can get it in there, um, it, depending on the dog's anatomy. The bigger, the easier. But on the lingual side of those two roots, and it makes makes that extraction so much easier as well. So if you're doing a lot of extractions, uh, that vet tome is cheaper on Dr. Brett's pets than it is from IM3, who is a manufacturer. Uh, it's ordered directly through them. It's shipped through them. All the warranties are the same. Um, we just have it for less than what they have it. So if, you, if you're if you doing a lot of extractions, you won't use it every day, but you will love it and not want to part with it. We, we take ours every time we travel to Orlando and Atlanta. I, I, I will not do extractions without it. And if we forget it, I, I, I don't think we have, um, but if, if we were to forget it, I'd be, I'd be upset. <laughs> it's invaluable if you're doing a lot of extractions. If you're not, if you're not doing those teeth, um, if you're not doing a lot of fractured teeth, if you're doing mainly perio and you're not doing those teeth, then I would not even consider it. But for those of you who are, uh, it, it, it's, it's a practice changer uh, if, if you're doing a lot. For class two malocclusion, Kyle, would it be appropriate to extract mandibular canines if clients can't afford referral? Um, if and let, let's qualify that by saying if this is a significant class two malocclusion where you have a tooth on tissue or tooth on tooth contact, then uh, the the other options are preferred. But and you can definitely extract the mandibular canines uh, to resolve that. That that's that's perfectly acceptable treatment, but you have to ask yourself how severe is the trauma. If you are doing odontoplasty and bonding, which most of you aren't, um, you could certainly take that crown down a little bit uh, if it's not too much into the tissue and uh, see if you can um, avoid have and bond it. I don't know if I just said that or not. And bond it and then extubate and see if you still have contact. And uh, you may be able to avoid that, that profound extraction treatment. But otherwise, yes. Um, if, if, if it's causing significant damage, the owners can't refer and you're comfortable doing extractions on mandibular canines that don't have periodontal disease, uh, which most people aren't, then extraction is a perfect um, perfect resolution to that. But all in all, um, <clears throat> referral, 
depending on where you're at, um, probably not that much more expensive uh, if it's a one-time procedure than it would be uh, for for uh, extraction. But again, depends on what you charge. Uh, you should be charging quite a bit because that, in general practice, that should be a um, probably an hour hour and 15 per side procedure. Um, in, in specialty practice, it's definitely not, but in, in general practice, it may be. Good question. She's asking why that mandibular second molar that I mentioned was uh, a, a difficult extraction. It's, it's back in the back part of the mouth. It's in very thick cortical bone. Those roots are often curved and they are, um, it's difficult to, to access that if you fracture the roots. You have to be really careful in elevation. You have to be very gentle, uh, firm but gentle. And again, that head loop comes in absolutely essential there so you can see if you're, you're moving the tooth uh, so that you don't put too much pressure on it. And I, I generally recommend uh, when you're doing that to start in the forcation after you section it and use um, just use two finger pressure on that and just watch that watch that tooth uh, uh, or watch those teeth separate from each other as you do that and kind of get an idea for how much pressure you're, you're putting on that in that respect and how much mobility you're getting if you're doing this and getting zero mobility that's going to be a hard extraction and you might you might have to do a flap if you do a flap, it's it's not a, a fun area to, to, to remove bone because the deeper those roots get, the more thick the alveolar bone gets. So it's best to try not to do a flap on that unless you're already doing a flap on the mandibular first molar. And even then, I will try to section that and extract that tooth first without doing a flap and uh, see if I can get it out without a flap, even if I'm doing the mandibular molar. So um, try to try to do that first. Uh, if you're not, and and a lot of times that tooth is is coming out because of perio. So uh, sometimes sometimes it's super easy. You section it, and the roots are are mobile. But if it's not perio, and we get this a lot with uh, chronic ulcerative periodontal stomatitis or cups, where the teeth have not undergone periodontal disease, but all of them or many of them need to be removed because of the inflammation in the tissue next to them, uh, but there's no bone loss. So that's that's a common uh, common presentation that we see that we we, we use often and uh, we see probably more often than you guys will. Most of the time you're extracting that tooth, it's going to be from perio. I trust you enjoyed that episode. We enjoyed providing it. If you would, do us a big favor and go to our iTunes page, post a rating and review, and take a picture of that with your cell phone, and then post it on our Facebook page, and we'll send you the Instrument Use Essentials course. If you also look below, there is a link to two live trainings that we do. And one is on radiographic interpretation. The other is on killer tips for quicker extractions. If you have not been to those, register for the one that's coming up next. And the link will be in the show notes on the website, The Vet Dental Show. And we'll get you in and get you a 30-minute, 40-minute overview of those topics that are really insightful and all take home and then we'll also give you an opportunity to get a great deal and some bonuses on those two courses that are online courses that span uh, five hours and seven hours. So hopefully you enjoyed this episode. Hopefully you'll help us out uh, with the post on our Facebook group. And then as a little extra bonus for you, you've got that link down there. You can register if you haven't been to either one of those and enjoy all of that content uh, that we're going to give you on those two topics. So take care. We'll see you next week.